Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, thank you so much for joining me. I am so excited to have you. And if you are returning, welcome back. I'm so excited to see you again. I do have to apologize for missing two weeks again, but uh, as you guys probably know, I do have a full-time job and that is starting to consume my life a little bit with election season coming around the corner. And yeah, sometimes I just get a little bit overwhelmed and I've decided that I would rather uh, focus on quality instead of quantity. So instead of rushing through a video and making a mediocre video, I would prefer to take my time to make a better video. So I'm sure the majority of you will understand um, because you are all so loving and so wonderful. So thank you so much. But I am back this week and I hope to be back again next week. So uh, yeah, I make true crime videos if you're new here after my long introduction, but I do make some true crime videos on, uh, I usually try to post on Wednesdays. Like I said, not always, but I do try to post on Wednesdays. So if that is something that you might be interested in, you can go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below as well as the bell icon so you can be notified when I upload upload only if you're interested though no pressure i do want to give a quick warning that some of the things that we talk about can be pretty heavy so if that is something your mental health cannot handle just go ahead and click off this video i can catch you somewhere else but your mental health will always be so much more important than any youtube video ever will be i also want to uh add something else that we need to remember that the victims of the things we talk about are probably still alive and are still affected by the things that we are talking about. So please always remember to be respectful and kind in the comments because you never know who's reading it and you never know who's watching it. So I really want to focus on creating a community of respect and love towards everyone. So yeah, just please remember that these are real people. This isn't just a story that we can shrug off. This is a, a real thing that happened to real people and I think we really need to uh, make sure that we remember that. But with all of that being said, let's go ahead and jump into today's video. And I will say this one is a doozy. There is a lot of moving parts and it will get kind of confusing. So I'm going to try to make it as not confusing as possible. So just bear with me as we get through it. So yeah, let's go ahead and dive in. Today we're going to be talking about a man named Christian Carl I've got to look down to pronounce his name, Gerhartswriter, Gerhartswriter, and I, I might have said that wrong. Go ahead and correct me in the comments. I did go to Google for Google Translate uh, pronunciation, but it will sometimes mislead me. So if I said it wrong, just correct me down in the comments. Christian Gerhartswriter was also known as Chris Gerhart, Christopher Chetchester, Christopher Crow, and Clark Rockefeller. So. Keep all of these names in mind as we kind of go through the story today because I'm going to refer to each person as that name. So like I said, it's a crazy one. So just hang on with me and we will get through it, I promise. Christian was born in a small town in Germany named Bergen in 1961. Since he was very little, he always told his friends and family that one day he planned to move to America. As luck would have it, when he was a teenager, he met a couple that was backpacking across Germany named Elmer and Jean Colleen. Now, I have seen a couple of other names out there about the couple that he met, but I'm going to go with Elmer and Jean for now because that's the one I saw the most. But he met Elmer and Jean while they were backpacking and they kind of became friends during this period. And as polite people do, Jean and Elmer told Christian that if he ever found himself in Connecticut, that he should look them up because they'd be happy to put him up for a night and uh, just kind of went on their way. I think that they said this kind of more as a polite thing, the way we sometimes do, you know, when we meet someone like saying, oh yeah, if, I, if you're ever in town, look me up. Um, never actually intending to meet up with this person, but Christian did not take it that way at all. In 1979, when Christian was 17 years old, he found himself in a position where he was able to get to America. Now, in order to uh, go through immigration, he would need to uh, come up with some kind of lie letting him stay in the country. He told immigration officers that he was actually an exchange student and he was getting ready to stay with an American couple in America and that's how he got through customs. Christian did look up Elmer and Jean and he knocked on their door and somehow convinced them to let him stay with them. He said that he was going to school there, he was a part of the foreign exchange program and Elmer and Jean did let him in, he slept on their 
their couch and they enrolled him in their school and everything seemed to be going well, except Christian refused to do any housework whatsoever. He refused to cook breakfast. He uh, felt like he needed freshly pressed clothes every single day. And he was just kind of a royal pain in the behind. He, <laughs> I cannot imagine going to somebody's house and uh, just showing up and then expecting them to do everything for me, but that's exactly what Christian did. Months would go by of this and eventually Jean and Elmer decided that they had had enough and they kicked Christian out. But instead of going back to Germany, uh, Christian just continued to find other families that would agree to host him until I'm assuming the same thing would kind of happen. But as time went on, Christian decided that he needed to bigger and better things. By this point it was 1980 and Christian had found himself in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and he was actually going to film school there. And that's where he met a woman named Amy Gersild. Amy and a Christian were seeing each other. They were in a romantic relationship and Christian knew that he needed to make his residency more permanent. He needed a green card in order to stay in America. So he convinced Amy to marry him. This was a brand new relationship, but he told Amy that if he did not get married or if they did not get married, that he would be sent back to Germany and be sent to the front lines in war. And Amy didn't want this to happen. So she agreed to marry him, but this marriage was very short lived because Christian kind of disappeared after he got married to Amy. By the time he had married Amy, he had kind of shortened his name to Chris Gerhardt, and this is who Amy married. But as about a week or so after they got married, Chris got his green card and he vanished. He decided to go to Los Angeles and that's where he changed his name to Christopher Chichester. Now this name is vastly different than just shortening his name from Chris Gerhardt, but he actually changed it to Chris, uh, Christopher Chichester. And sometimes he would even add that his middle name was Mountbatten. Mountbatten. So to, just to make it more fancy. He even had business cards with a family crest and he said that he came from a higher society. And it didn't take long for Christian to become a part of LA's higher society. Um, he was in film school at the time and he had even convinced a local TV channel to give him um, a public access show. And it just seemed to be going really well for him as Christopher Chichester. People did notice a couple of strange things about Christopher because he claimed to come from such a um, aristocratic family and yet he drove a really crappy car and he had sticky notes all over this car. P people noticed that he had uh, just random sticky notes all over this car but no one really questioned much more about it. But eventually Christopher found his way into the life of a woman named Dee Dee Sohos. Dee Dee was an older woman and she did have a little bit of a drinking problem, but Dee Dee was pretty well off. It didn't take long for Christopher to uh, kind of wiggle his way into her life. And that's when he started uh, living with Dee Dee. And not only was he living with her, he was also mooching off of her. So Dee Dee would buy him a lot of fancy clothes and a lot of fancy things to kind of keep up with this lie that he was telling of being an aristocrat. Dee Dee had a son named Jonathan and Jonathan had just recently gotten married to a woman named Linda. Now Jonathan and Linda decided to move back in with Dee Dee and that's when they soon noticed that uh, Christopher was spending a lot of Dee Dee's money and this would create a lot of turmoil in the house and cause a lot of fighting. This fighting would go on until 1985 when suddenly Jonathan and Linda with the help of Christopher got this uh, government job that was in Europe. Now they weren't able to really give specifics to Dee Dee about this job because it was a government job, but it was in computers and Jonathan had worked in computers before. And this was kind of when computers were becoming a much bigger thing. So it wasn't such a far reach, but Jonathan and Linda just up and disappeared one day. At first they would send postcards to Dee Dee, kind of just keeping uh, her up to date with what was going on in their life. But those postcards kind of started tapering off until just stopping altogether. About five months after Jonathan and Linda took this job in Europe, Dee Dee became very suspicious and actually filed a missing persons report on Jonathan. Dee Dee told investigators the whole story about them getting this job in Europe and then just up and leaving and how she had a roommate named Christopher and how Jonathan had given 
or how she thought Jonathan had given Christopher his truck because he was moving to Europe, he wasn't going to need it. Investigators decided that they needed to talk to Christopher. He would be a good lead to talk to in the disappearance of Jonathan, but Christopher had also just up and disappeared very suddenly. Eventually, all leads would kind of come to a dead end and they were unable to find anything more out about Christopher or the disappearance of Jonathan and Linda and it just kind of went cold. Unfortunately, Dee Dee passed away in 1988 without having any answers as to what happened to Jonathan or Linda. Shortly after Dee Dee uh, passed away, police officers were able to get a lead and this time it was from the uh, truck that had gone missing, that was Jonathan's. I said that really weird, but Jonathan's missing truck. They found Jonathan's missing truck all the way in Connecticut. Now this is like c across the country. So how Jonathan's truck got to Connecticut was a really good question, but it was now not registered to anybody. Well, it was still registered to Jonathan. And there was a man uh, trying to sell it without the registration. And this man's name was Christopher Crow. I think I forgot to say this earlier, but Dee Dee lived in Los Angeles, and so Los Angeles is very far away from Connecticut. And so uh, investigators in Los Angeles started talking to Connecticut investigators, and through this communication, they were able to find out that Christopher Crow was in fact Christopher Chichester. So it's the same guy trying to sell this pickup, but why is he in possession of Jonathan's pickup? So now knowing that Christopher Chichester and Christopher Crow and Chris Gerhart and, and Christo Christian Gerhart's reader are all the same person, we need to know what happened to Christopher or Christian after he left Los Angeles. When he left Los Angeles, he went back to Connecticut and there he was able to get into a position of power as an executive at a, at a brokerage firm. He was eventually fired from this job after his employer realized that the social security number he had given as his own was actually the social security number of David Berkowitz who is the son of Sam, who was a serial killer in New York City. So they fired him from this job, and so he worked his way into two other jobs, and one, I'm not entirely sure what happened there, but in the other, uh, this is when police were starting to look for him, and they had realized that he was actually Christopher Crow. So he started trying to dodge police. Every time police came in to talk to him, he would uh, either be out of the office or busy and unable to communicate with them or speak with them. And eventually he went into his boss's office and said that his parents had actually been, um, had gone missing in Afghanistan and he now needed to go look for them in Afghanistan. So he very suddenly quit this job and then vanished once again. After Christopher or Chris or whatever his name is at this point left Connecticut, this is when he fled to New York City. I'm assuming he went to New York City because it's such a massive city that it's pretty easy to disappear there. But while he was in New York City back in Los Angeles in 1994, a new family had bought Dee Dee's house and at this they had lived in it for a couple of years. Dee Dee had been gone for about six years at this point and they um, decided that they wanted to have a pool in their backyard. So they hired a construction company to come and dig a hole. While construction was happening for this pool, the construction workers came across what looked to be a bag of bones. The current family was obviously questioned about this, but they were soon able to find out that this bag of bones had been there for much longer than the current family lived there. So they looked into the previous owner and that's when they found it was Dee Dee Sohos' house. And that's when they found the missing persons report that Dee Dee had filed for her son, Jonathan. They were unable to do DNA testing on these bones because Jonathan was actually adopted. Dee Dee was not his biological mother. And so they were unable to do any DNA testing on this body. But I mean, it's kind of obvious that it's Jonathan, isn't it? Because he just randomly disappears and then years later they find bones. Like, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to kind of figure out what's going on there. This is when they decided that they really wanted to talk to Christopher and they needed to find him. So in order to do this, they even posted about this case on the Unsolved Mystery Show. I'm not sure if you guys remember that old, I think it was in the 80s and the 90s, the um, um, Unsolved Mysteries. It was a huge show and they ran an episode that was talking about the Jonathan Sohos case. May 1994, 
San Marino, California, just north of Los Angeles. Excavation for a backyard swimming pool came to an abrupt halt when workmen made a grim discovery. Three plastic bags and a fiberglass box containing dismembered sections of a human skeleton. Detectives probing the disappearance encountered a cast of characters that might have been dreamed up by a mystery writer. Though married for two years, John and Linda still lived with John's mother, Dee Dee Sohas, by all accounts, an alcoholic. However, the most intriguing character would prove to be a mysterious young man who went by the name Christopher Chichester. But this would basically lead nowhere. They were unable to find Christopher despite having this case on national television. So the reason that they couldn't find Christopher Chichester or Christopher Crow or Christian was because he had actually moved to New York City and he was now going under the name Clark Rockefeller. Now you've probably heard of the Rockefeller family, one of the oldest and richest families in probably the world. I, I think it is in the world. But so I'm not entirely sure why he would go under the name Rockefeller because it's such an easily searchable name. But he did say that he was a distant rel relative of the Rockefellers and that his parents had actually died in a tragic car accident when he was very young. So he had never gotten to know the Rockefeller family very well at all. He also said that his mother was a famous actress and that she had passed away. And so this is kind of how uh, Cl uh, Clark at this point kind of got into the higher societies of New York City. It's very easy to get into certain places with a name like Rockefeller. And this is actually how he met a woman named Sandra Boss in 1993. Sandra was a, a very successful woman in her own right. She was an executive at a consulting firm and she was kind of described as shy and quiet and a little bit she just kind of liked to keep to herself, but instantly Sandra was smitten with Clark because he was so charming, he was so outgoing, and just so easy to get along with. Clark claimed that he owned a nonprofit in Canada, and so it just kind of seemed like a match made in heaven. Two very successful people who could build a very pleasant life for themselves. So unsurprisingly, Clark and Sandra got married in 1994. So even though Clark claimed to own this nonprofit, they lived entirely off of Sandra's money. She made a couple of million dollars a year for herself, so they definitely were not hurting, but they did live entirely off of her salary. Soon they would move to Connecticut because they wanted to kind of get out of the fast paced New York City lifestyle and kind of go into a more rural type town. And that's where they welcomed in a baby girl and they both loved her very much. Sandra especially, she loved her daughter very much. And that's when they decided that maybe moving to Boston would be better because they wanted to make sure that their daughter was around more children her age and have more social interaction. So their daughter was born in 2001 and they moved to Boston in 2000. And six. From the outside, everything seemed to be absolutely wonderful within the marriage. They kind of seemed to be this perfect couple that just had everything and everything was put together. And you, you know what I'm talking about, that couple where everything is just perfect. But Sandra would come out later and say from the inside, things were not quite what they seemed. Clark was controlling, he was jealous, and he was uh, controlling over Sandra's money. Because remember, she's the main breadwinner here. Clark doesn't do anything except for mooch off of people. And so Sand he was controlling of Sandra's money, telling her what to spend it on. He wouldn't give her any money. All the money went to him. And he was very verbally and emotionally abusive towards Sandra. In order to hide his true identity, Clark would always tell Sandra to, uh, file as a single person and she would do that until eventually she would have to go to an accountant to have her taxes done and then when she went to the accountant Clark went to the accountant and told him that they were actually siblings and so the accountant would continue to file Sandra's taxes as a single person. He was doing this to hide his real identity and eventually all of this would come crumbling down when Sandra found out that the mother that Clark claimed to have, who was this actress who had died, she found out that the actress he said was his mother was actually still alive. And this one lie was able to completely tear apart all the tangled webs that he had weaved because Sandra became really curious, what else has he lied to me about? So she hired a private investigator to look deeper into Clark's identity. Now the private investigator did not find 
Clark's real identity. He didn't find out that Clark was in fact Christian from Germany, but he was able to find out enough that Sandra filed for divorce. And in the divorce, uh, they it was it was a nasty divorce. They, this was not just a cut and dry case, but Sandra was able to get away with paying an $800,000 settlement. Uh, she had to give back a dress that Clark had bought her. She had to give him her engagement ring, but she was able to get full custody of her daughter. And Clark was given three visitations a year that were 100% supervised. Sandra then moved to England with her daughter and that's where they were living together. And in July of 2008, Sandra's daughter was brought back to Boston to have one of those supervised visits with Clark. And and they had a social worker with them. They were going for a walk and Clark was holding their daughter's hand and the social worker was walking nearby when a car came and pulled up next to them and Clark pushed the social worker down into the ground and scooped up his daughter and then got into the car. Now the social worker is an absolute hero in this story because she hung on to the car until she eventually, like she was dragged along the road until she eventually had to let go. But police were called and the FBI very quickly got involved because Clark and his daughter were just gone. They were able to track Clark all the way to Grand Central Station in New York City, but after that, the case went cold. Sandra went on TV pleading for Clark to bring their daughter home to just make, you know, to bring her home, make sure that she was safe, but Clark didn't respond to this because he's obviously a sociopath. Clark, all the things have changed. You will always be Ray's father, and I will always be Ray's mother. We both love her dearly and have only her best interests and well-being at heart. I ask you now, please, please bring Snooks back. There has to be a better way for us to solve our differences than this way. I also want to thank everyone for your help. And Ray, honey, I love you. I miss you so much. And remember, you're always a princess. And there were multiple news reports about uh, Clark's daughter being missing. And as luck would have it, there was a realtor in Baltimore, Maryland, who had just helped Clark buy, a, uh, buy an apartment in Baltimore, who saw these news reports of this missing girl and she recognized Clark right away. But Clark was going under the name Charles Smith at this point. This realtor called the FBI and um, they were able to find the apartment that he had just bought. And they also found that he had bought a boat and was docking it at a marina close by. So the FBI concocted this plan and the marina helped. They called Clark and said that his boat was taking on water and this was to lure him out of the apartment. And when he came out of the apartment, he was arrested and they did find Sandra's daughter in the apartment. She was unharmed and she was returned safely to Sandra, which is such amazing news. But Clark was then arrested and that's when everything would absolutely come crashing down all around him. So going into the interrogation with Christian, because his name is Christian, but going into the interrogation with Christian, police were finally able to kind of see exactly who he was and what he was doing. During the course of the investigation into Sandra's missing daughter, they were able to find a fingerprint and that fingerprint was led back into a uh, immigration file from when Christian first entered the United States in the 80s. So that's how they were able to find out that Clark Rockefeller was actually Christian Carl Gerhardt Gerhardt's writer, Gerhardt's writer. I think I'm saying that correctly. So at this point, Christian is obviously arrested and he's charged with kidnapping and assault with a deadly weapon for uh, the attack on the, or for the social worker who was drugged by the car. During the defense of kidnapping his daughter, he tried to play off that his daughter was communicating with him telepathically from England asking him to rescue her. Now, in my opinion, I do feel like he's trying to be found not guilty by reason of insanity. This is just my opinion. But at this point, he has lied for such a long time that this is just second nature to him. And I think that this is his way of trying to get out of the kidnapping charges. But that didn't happen and he was found guilty and sentenced from four to seven years in prison for the uh, abduction and the assault on the social worker. And while this whole web of lies is untangling, it entangles his 
other web of lies of being Christopher Chechester and the murder of Jonathan Sohos. Now they do finally find out that Christopher Chechester is also Christian and so they are able to kind of put together a case. Now most of it is circumstantial because they don't even fully have evidence that this body is that of Jonathan Sohos but it's pretty obvious that it that it is Jonathan's body because he just kind of disappears and then there's a body found at Dee Dee's old house so it is pretty obvious that it is his but it is still circumstantial since there was no way of DNA testing Jonathan's remains but they did also have the evidence that uh christian was in possession of jonathan's pickup and christian had disappeared and when they unearthed this body they also found two books and one was from the film school in milwaukee that christian was attending and also the film school in la that he was attending so <laughs> i believe in coincidences but three coincidences is just it, there can't be three coincidences in a murder case neighbors of dd also remember christian coming to their house and asking to borrow a chainsaw which is a very sad and grim thing but it is the uh, neighbor did come and testify saying that christian had come to his house and asked for a chainsaw and that he had given him that they were unable to charge christian with the murder of linda because they weren't able to find linda's body and to this day linda's body has never been found so nobody has been convicted of linda's murder but i think it's pr I, th I think if we take all the evidence in account we can pretty much see what happened to linda and jonathan but still all of this is circumstantial evidence evidence but it didn't take the jury long to come back with a guilty verdict and he was sentenced to 26 years to life for the murder of Jonathan Sohos and that's where Christian sits to this day. I know this case was uh, a lot wild this case was crazy and I really hope that I did okay with trying to keep all of the names correct but it really makes me wonder how Christian was able to tell all of these lies and get away with it without anybody questioning anything. It reminds me of that case um what's her name i forget her name but netflix just did a like a uh, kind of series about her anna delvey that's her name and it just kind of makes me wonder how are people like anna delvey and christian able to convince so many people that they're so wealthy and so well off and are have all these connections when they have nothing to their name at all it's just mind-blowing to me how these things can how you can just get away with it. And Christian really would have gotten away with murder had he not abducted his daughter. So yeah, that's that's the story of Christian Gerhardt's, Gerhardt's writer. Gerhardt, Gerhardt's writer. I'm really sorry that I'm butchering his name so much. It's just a hard one for me to say. But what do you think about this? Yeah, what are your thoughts? How do you think that they were that he was able to convince so many people that he was this aristocrat. I would love to know your thoughts down in the comments. As always, here is another reminder to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon only if you want to, no pressure. And yeah, but that's pretty much all I have for you this week. I hope this finds you so well. I hope it finds you loved and safe and with all the blessings in the world. And I will hopefully see you next week.